Hi, this is Kyle Eastwood, and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi, and welcome to ForBassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. You know, a lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created for BassPlayersOnly.com for adults who want to learn bass because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music. For BassPlayersOnly.com, let's play bass. My guest this week is Kyle Eastwood. Kyle is a highly accomplished bass player, band leader, and composer. He's toured and performed extensively with his own group, and he's contributed a lot of music over the years to his father's movies. His father is Clint Eastwood. But the big news right now is the release of Kyle's 10th album. It's called Eastwood Symphonic, dedicated exclusively to the music of his father's films. The album was recorded in Prague with the Czech National Symphony Orchestra, and it includes music from A Fistful of Dollars, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, Dirty Harry, Magnum Force, The Iger Sanction, to name a few. Composers, including Lalo Schifrin, Lenny Niehaus, John Williams. It's an absolute masterpiece. The music, the arrangements, the production, and the performance just doesn't get any better. Welcome, Kyle. Welcome back. It's good to have you back on For Bass Players Only. Oh, good to be back. Thank you for having me. We did an interview, you may recall, at the 2017 Detroit Jazz Festival when you were playing. I do. I think up on the roof of the hotel, wasn't it? I seem to remember. Well, it was in the back, right on the on the river. From maybe we were up yeah, on the roof. Yeah, I, I think know. it was up on the roof deck or something. I seem to remember, but yeah, yeah, yeah that's a great I, festival. I watched that. Yes, it is. The uh, your your in transit album was pretty new at the time, and by the way, I've played that to death. I just love it. Oh, thank you. The, this current project is a very different kind of undertaking, though. So let me just ask you: How long have you been thinking about this about Eastwood Symphonic? Well, I, for a few years, actually. I mean, it uh, it started off as the idea was to to maybe do an album with a full symphony you know, with my band and then with a full symphony orchestra, you know, and, and do film music. Cause the album I'd done before Eastwood Symphonic was, was also film music based, but um, it was just that my quintet. Um, and it was from, you know, different composers and different films over the years that I kind of grew up loving and listening to. And, and, and some of my favorite film composers, but um, the idea was to sort of maybe do an album with a full symphony and kind of, um, you know, do a similar approach, but then the idea kind of changed and I thought maybe it'd be nice to sort of pay homage to my father and, and, and sort of focus on the music from his films and from his career, really. So uh, um, that sort of started to take shape in about 2019. And then, of course, COVID happened and uh, sort of put a hold on on that and, and everything else. So um, uh, uh, but it's so it's been an, an idea for a while, actually. How did you go about selecting the music? I mean, you had a lot to choose from. Sure, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of music to choose from. I mean, I, I kind of tried to pick some stuff from his entire career and you know represent his this sort of entire breadth of his career. You know, so I, I mean, I started of course with some of the Ennio Morricone pieces, and because uh, you know you sort of obliged to pick a few of those. You know, so um, uh, I did fistful, picked fistful of dollars, and um, it's the first film. He did with him with uh, for Sergio Leone and um, and then Good, the Bad, and the Ugly because you know that's sort of one of the iconic pieces and um, and then yeah it kind of moved moved through his whole career more or less coming up to more present day really. Well, how did you end up doing it in Prague? How did that come about? Well, um, Gast Walsing, who did a lot of the arranging and and does the and was the conductor on the project and has been conducting all the pro all the, the gigs we've been doing live. Um, he'd worked with the orchestra quite a bit, and they do a lot of film music there. They record a lot of film music with that orchestra, and uh, so um, we just thought we thought it'd be a good idea to go there and 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 record it with them. And uh, they have a really nice studio, and they're kind of used to doing sort of sort of projects like this. It's a great production. It sounds so good. 
you know, I, I expected to like it, but it was so much more than I expected. The solos, the improvisation, they're just a beautiful balance between the classically oriented stuff and the jazz. So I thought that you, oh, you did the you. arrangements. Well, that was that was the, that was the trick was really to try and get the, you know, to to feature the the quintet and and have the quintet do our do our thing, you know, and be able to play play jazz but with, you know, but accompanied by the whole symphony orchestra, you know, because sometimes the two don't always, you know, it's a little, the trick is to sort of get them to sort of ma match up, you know, and uh, have a, us be able to do our thing and, and have them follow along, really. So, um, yeah, Gast, who did, did a, well, he did most of the arrangements on it, and he's, uh, he's actually a perfect choice, really, because he's uh, a jazz trumpet player as well, and as well as a composer and arranger and, and conductor. So he's actually quite... It, good at sort of keeping the sort of jazz and symphony thing together <laughs> yeah it's 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 so natural it doesn't sound forced like uh, you hear many times or like you're in an elevator and you hear you know, i mean it's yeah. very far away from that it's it's just gorgeous and i i don't know i guess maybe i should have expected the the you know the quintet with the orchestra but it, it was a very nice surprise i enjoyed it a lot oh thank you and not only is there some really great bass playing, but the tone on your basses is just incredible. Are you still playing oh, the nice. David Gage, very uh, bizarrely shaped uh, upright with the realist? <laughs> I do, yeah. I, t I mean, that's what I play on the road. Actually, that's what I played on the recording as well, actually, because uh, we were we were kind of in the middle of the, the tour when we went in to, to do the album. So, yeah, I still play that. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of become my bass. I mean, I have an old Pullman bass which is actually right down here on the floor somewhere but um uh it doesn't really go anywhere anymore <laughs> i don't really travel with it you know so uh um yeah the david gage one i use quite a bit you know, you know especially on the road and what about the electrics i could see a few of them over your shoulder there what did you use on the record or what are your primary go-to electric bases um, the electrics are actually uh, sort of two custom models that uh, that Bunny Brunell designed originally for that was going to be a project for Gibson to put out, and then Gibson never ended up putting that out. And then I think he went to Carbon and did them with um, Carbon, and uh, now I can't remember. He's with another someone else is making a similar sort of design, but uh, but um, the, the ones I have are actually two prototypes. Like uh, actually, yeah, that. Well, that one I get no. Sorry, I'm reverse. That one over on the wall, yeah, is uh, is uh, is one of them. So I just, I pretty much st stuck to playing fretted, uh, fretted bass, fretted five string bass. Now, Bunny reached out to me a, a couple of weeks ago. Or his wife did. Uh, you're, you're on the new album, Baseball Two. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I well, yeah, I played on a track for that. Yeah, I studied with Bunny yeah. for for quite a few years actually, and he's he's an old old friend and. Was a great sort of mentor and teacher for me for, for quite a few yes, years. Yes, yes, I've gotten to know him over the years. He's a very, very good guy. Um, are you used to playing labella strings? I do. Yeah, I play labella strings, and um, yeah, I mean my electrics are, are. I have a fretted and a fretted fretless five string. That, that's kind of what I I focus on. But I mean, I have a few things laying around that I kind of fool around on once in a while. I like there's actually that's. That's one of Bunny's old uh, Yamaha BB three thousands on the wall, four string over there. That one right there, it's actually, uh, that I picked up from him years ago. Yeah, yeah sorry, <laughs> I know it's weird with the reverse. Yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, I have a collection of a few things sitting around. But the two, the sort of two prototypes, the Brunel sort of prototypes, are the ones I use the most on the road and for recording. Just curious, do you use the labellas on the upright too? I do. Yeah, yeah. And do you do much bowing? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I started playing in film orchestras, you know, when I was living in Los Angeles, you know, years ago, and and playing, uh, you know, some a few sessions doing that. So I kind of, uh, I actually, Bunny sort of got me into learning sort of Bach, you know, some of the Bach cello, you know, sweet etudes and things like that. So um, that's how I sort of got my my Boeing stuff together, but it's definitely not, it's not my forte, but I mean, I, I, I do, I do keep it in practice a bit. 
The reason I ask, it's kind of hard to find a, a good string that sounds good with Pitts and with the bow. And the labellas are pretty popular. Buster Williams, Ron Carter, you know, people like that. He's... Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's hard. It's hard to find one that's, that's really great for both. But um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't I don't do a ton of bowing, but I mean, I do I do a bit, you know, here and there on some pieces and and uh, French bow or German bow. French. Well, I studied with, you know, Bunny's a Frenchman, so <laughs> I, I, I picked, I'd started playing French, French bow. Let's talk a little more about bass. For bass players only, we have over 800 interviews now, but we're, we're primarily a bass instruction site. So I've okay. got people from pretty much all 50 states and some 50, 60 countries worldwide coming to for bass players only every day to learn how to play bass through the membership I have and the digital courses. And most of the people that I'm attracting are adults. Most of them are men in their 50s, 60s, 70s. I had a guy sign up the other day, 83 years old. Really? And they're not, they're not trying to, you know, set the world on fire. They're not trying to make a career out of it. They want to play some some classic rock riffs with their buddies or some blues shuffles or, you know, maybe some walking bass, maybe a little funk R&B. And yeah. at that age, it's, some of us know things like arthritis and tendonitis and those kinds of things kick in. And I'm, I'm telling you yeah. all this just to give you a picture of some of the people that are, are coming here and some of the people that are dealing with those things and they still want to play bass. So that was kind of a setup for asking you, what advice can you impart to somebody like that who wants to learn how to play bass? What do you think is important for them to know or to think about? I mean, I started off just playing. I mean, I took piano lessons when I was a kid, you know, so I learned a bit of music theory and and, and music at the piano, you know. So I, I, my father taught me a little bit when I was, you know, first starting out, and then uh, I took piano lessons, and then uh, I just kind of learned a little guitar for a film I did with my father when I was about. 13 and so I learned a couple of chords and that was kind of my first experience with a string instrument you know and um, then after that I kind of picked up bass electric bass and started teaching myself how to play it and just just listening to records really you know and listening to great you know bass lines and things like that and trying to figure out how to play them really and um, um, I don't know I mean I think you know get in if you're listening to good music and um, I think I mean for me important thing was finding a really good teacher you know to, to teach me some, some technique and some, you know, some, yeah, really just like so, some good techniques so you can, you know, execute things, you know, and, and not hurt yourself, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think that's important really, you know, because like you said, with tendonitis and things like that, or, you know, I think it's, it's good to have, to start off with like good, good technique, you know, there's a misconception also. A lot of people think you have to have superhuman chops to play the bass because, you know, especially the upright is a beast, but even the electric. And what I try to impress upon my students is that even a super simple bass line can make the music feel great. You can play simple. A lot of times you'll play a better bass line if it well, breathes. That's, that's probably better most better. of the time, actually, <laughs> is to play simple. I mean, I think they are the most important thing for for bass and, and drums is like, is to, is to really feel good. You know, that's, I mean, if it doesn't, doesn't matter how busy it is or what, you know, or how many crazy, how much crazy harmonic movement you've got going on or whatever, if it doesn't feel good, you know, you just sort of, that's, what's the point, you know? So I think, yeah, it has to, it has to sit well and, and, and feel good, you know? So sometimes simpler is, is, is better, you know, less yeah, is more just <laughs> sometimes. Not just the music, but in most things in life, you know. Yeah. You still spending a lot of your time, or I think last time you said more than half of your time in Paris. I do. Yeah. I mean, I play over there a good deal of the year. I'd say in in Europe, I play about five six months out of the year. So yeah, I'm just back in the states for a couple of weeks, just um, for a little family catch up, and uh, and then uh, I'm going back uh, in about a week to go back on tour over there starting in early November. So, so yeah, I'm in, I'm in based in Paris quite a bit of the time. Yeah. 
Well, how did that happen? Were you touring and you, you played in Paris and you liked it and decided you wanted to spend a lot kind of time? Kind of, yeah. I mean, I really, I was, I was living in New York for about six years or so, and I started going over there and playing, you know, somewhat regularly. And uh, yeah, I kind of just thought I'd go and spend some time over there for a while and, and, and see how it went. And uh, I've been over there for the better part of the last sort of 15, 16 years now, so. You ever run across Rick Margitza? I think he's sure. Great. I just played with him uh, about a month and a half ago, actually. Yeah, yeah. No, I see Rick all. I see Rick off, often. Yeah, he's a great, great, great player. He is. Tell him hello. We went to school together in Detroit, and then also in Miami. Oh, really? Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he just, he just, um, he just did my, a gig with me for for my with, with depth for my sax player actually uh, on a gig like two two months ago. So. He's doing well. Yeah, he's, he sounds great. I, he was in New Orleans for a while. I remember I was there, and uh, he called me up, or I called him up. I sat in with his band at the, you know, the Snug Harbor in New Orleans. Sure, yeah, you know that. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that was uh, boy, that was like 1984. Oh my goodness, that was a long time. Oh, ago. that was a while ago. <laughs> yeah. Now he's doing well. He's still in Paris a good deal of the time. So what about you? What else is in store for the future? You've got 10 records now. You've got your band. You mentioned you're touring, but anything beyond that that you can see long term? Is there another project that you have in mind? Something percolating? I don't really have way? anything in mind at the moment. You know, I'm just really enjoying playing this this new album live. You know, we started we were, we did we did two concerts of the of it of like back in October last year, right before we went in the studio. Uh, right in France, and then uh, then we went in the studio and, and recorded it in, in Prague. But um, yeah, since then we did a, quite a bit of touring this year, this last summer, and uh, and we played with a different symphony orchestra in sort of each each city we go to. You know, so we we show up and rehearse a little bit, and then and then play with a different symphony. So um, so yeah, I've been really been enjoying playing the music live, you know, and getting a chance to sort of develop it a little bit more, you know, in, in live setting. So we're probably going to be doing that into next year a bit. And then, uh, I don't know, I'll just have to think about what to do next. Uh, you know, no in the early part of next year. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you know, it's been a while since my wife and I were in Paris. We keep talking about uh, how we want to go back. So uh, we will uh, we'll look you up. We'll find out where you're playing. We'll come out and hear you. I'm sure you'll be playing somewhere. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll be there. I'm playing around uh, around quite a bit in France through through middle of December, and then I'll probably come back to the states for a bit for for the holidays. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, the album is called Eastwood Symphonic. Highly recommended. Kyle Eastwood, congratulations again on doing such a stellar job. It really is beautiful. I'm not just saying that. I may be gushing a little bit, but it's all sincere. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I'm glad you. I'm, I'm really happy with it. You know, I'm happy with the way it came out, and uh, you know, I was, it was it was a pleasure for me to be able to sort of pay homage to to my dad and his career, and then and also to sort of pay homage to to the great film composers, you know, that have worked on his films over the years, you know, like Ennio Morricone and, and uh, Lalo Schifrin and John Williams, just to, just to name a couple. So. It's funny. I toured with an Argentinian group back in, also in the eighties when I was in Miami and the musical director was from Argentina and he was oh, yeah. friends with Lalo. He, he knew Lalo Schifrin from Argentina. So we were in L.A. and he says, I visited Lalo Schiffer and he lives in a beautiful house. Used to belong to Grucho Marx. <laughs> Grucho Marx. Yeah, that's right, actually. I know that actually, uh, I know he lives in Groucho's old house. Yeah, I met him. I actually got a chance to play with him once in Paris uh, and present him with an award. And I guessed it on the, on the, on, a, on a tune, but to, uh, he was conducting and stuff. But this was a few years back in Paris. But uh but uh, yeah, no, he's still he's still he's still around. He's a great, great, great composer. Really, because that's uh, he he must be getting up there. I think he's about ninety one now. I think or something like that. Okay, because I I remember a friend of mine said uh, he, he got called for a session years ago. My friend is a clarinet player, and he says I also want you to play flute and and like bass clarinet and saxophone and piccolo and just like a thousand different <laughs> instruments. He said it was oh, just right. ridiculous. 
I guess maybe that was uh, expected at, at the time or in that zeitgeist. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, how, how is your dad doing? What's uh, what's he got going on these days? He's doing well. I just saw him last week. He's um, he's uh, yeah. He he's actually waiting around for the for the strike to be over because he was in the middle of a film when the uh, when the actors you know, the, the Screen Actors Guild strike started. So they had to shut down, unfortunately. So um, he's waiting for that to be ironed out. And then uh, once they're finished, with, once they've, you know, stopped the strike, they can go back to work. So I think he's about only about halfway through the shooting. So he's still working, still, still, still doing his thing. Good for him. Good for him. Well, th thanks again, Kyle. It's great having you, and I, I wish you much luck and continued success. I know you've still got a lot of energy, and I can't wait to see what you're going to come up with next. All right. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. In person. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. A lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created for BassPlayersOnly.com for adults who want to learn to play bass because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music. For BassPlayersOnly.com, this is the place to learn bass. I will see you all next week. Same time, same place right here for BassPlayersOnly.com. Thanks again to Kyle Eastwood. In the meantime, let's play bass.